Hello, footnoting history listeners, both old and new. Welcome to the 8th edition of History for Halloween. It's the yearly episode where we all get together to share short bits of Halloween-appropriate history. I'm Christine, and it's my tradition to find my contribution by combing through historical newspapers. This year, I'm bringing you one that was published on July 28, 1788, in the Savannah Lamar Gazette from Savannah Lamar, Jamaica. Now, normally I retell these stories in my own words, but I feel like this one is better when read directly. So that's what I'm going to do, only I'm going to indicate when the speaker changes since you can't see the original italicized text that indicates it. Now, settle in, pretend you're reading the newspaper in the year 1788. Here we go. A late, very pious, but very credulous bishop was relating a strange story of a demon that haunted a girl in Lothbury, London, to a company of gentlemen, when one of them told his lordship the following tale. As I was one night reading in my bed, as my custom is, and all my family were at rest, I heard a foot deliberately ascending the stairs, and as it came nearer, I heard something breathe. While I was musing what it should be, Three hollow knocks at my door made me ask who was there, and instantly the door flew open. I, sir, and pray what did you see? the bishop asked. So the man explained. My lord, I'll tell you. A tall, thin figure stood before me, with withered hair and an earthy aspect. It was covered with a long, sooty garment that descended to its ankles, and its waist was clasped close within a broad leather girdle. In one hand, it held a black staff taller than itself, and in the other hand, a round body of pale light which shone feebly every way. That's remarkable. Pray, sir, go on, the bishop prodded. So the man continued. It beckoned to me, and I followed it downstairs, and there it pointed to the door, and then left me and made a hideous noise in the street. The bishop then said, This is really odd and surprising, but pray now. Did it give you no notice what it might particularly seek or aim at? Yes, my lord, the man answered. It was the watchman, who came to show me that my servants had left all my doors open. I hope you enjoyed this brief holiday chuckle, and have a happy, eerie, and safe Halloween. <laughs> happy Halloween, listeners. I'm Lucy, and for this year's spooky footnote, I'll be talking about hauntings and the haunted in early 20th century India. In 1917, S. Mukherjee published a collection simply titled Indian Ghost Stories, and that title is the only straightforward thing about it. Written for a primarily English audience, it deliberately invokes the English tradition of the ghost story and warns its readers that Indian ghost stories are something quite different. The preface begins, I do not know whether writing ghost stories is a mistake. I am fascinated by this collection because it showcases so many of the complexities of identities and histories under colonial rule. Mukherjee himself, as narrator, shows off his English education and English learning, quoting Shakespeare to demonstrate to his audience that he cannot be dismissed as superstitious. But he also demonstrates that many things cannot be learned from books or from Europeans. He tells the story of reading a magazine about ghosts in a train and being asked about it by a fellow passenger. His companion continues to tell of a family ghost in his village. What kind of thing is a family ghost? asks Mukherjee. Oh, the ghost comes and has his dinner with my neighbor every night, says the man. If you stay for a day in my village, you will learn everything. The inference is, of course, that if you don't spend time in villages, you may not learn things that are vital to know. Some of these unsettling narratives involve no ghost at all. In The Starving Millionaire, a rich and arrogant European contractor makes millions by supplying the railway companies. But he dismisses a starving beggar without food, and then 
laughs at him. And in the ensuing days, strange accidents prevent him from eating at all. In the end, he humbles himself and is told, You think that the deputy commissioner has power, but he has not. The deputy commissioner gets his power from the king. The man whom you have offended got his power from the king of kings. He leaves India within the month. In another story, Englishmen and their technologies become the hauntings. A municipal danger signal looms on the road with outstretched arm. A howling ghost with two glaring eyes turns out to be a motor car. A tennis net takes the form of a ghostly lady, foretelling evil for a household. Mukherjee also recounts the tale of a boy possessed by a ghost who torments him by speaking in English and demanding roast mutton and vegetables. This is viewed as a sign of probable ghost possession by the relatives, but we are told the doctor, who had been educated at the Calcutta Medical College, did not quite believe the ghost theory. Interrogation establishes that the ghost is none other than a deceased general who submits to cross-examination by a number of very confused English military officers. It turns out that he wants his tomb, which had been damaged, properly repaired. This is done, and Mukherjee tells us the boy has never been ill since. This is the whole story. He continues to convince his skeptical audience. A portion of it appeared in the papers, and there were several respectable witnesses. Not only does this story represent English people as violently possessing the bodies of their subjects and enforcing English customs, the moral of the story is one perhaps unwelcome. Inexplicable as it is, writes Mukherjee dryly, it appears that dead persons are a bit jealous of the sanctity of their tombs. Not only does Mukherjee tell ghost stories, he hints at others. He reproduces reports of newspapers, includes letters, recounts traditions. The War of 1857 haunts, one may say, many of the narratives. Of what befell Mukherjee's uncle at the hands of a ghost, he writes, This story need not have been written. It is too sad and too mysterious. The story is told by nurses and coachmen, he says, he will not include at all. But in the story of a boy who challenges a ghost, he further remarks, Every one of us has seen a ghost at some period of his existence. And if we have not actually seen one, some other person has, and has given us such a vivid description that we cannot but believe to be true what we hear. Hello, footnoting history friends, it's Kristen. And this Halloween, I need to tell you the story of Old Thies, an elderly village man who confessed to being a werewolf in 1691 Livonia. What is particularly striking about this case is not that there was a belief in people who could change into wolves and then back again. It's that Old Thies just offered this information, kind of casually, at someone else's trial, which had nothing whatsoever to do with the supernatural and then stuck to his guns. Old Thies, which is a Livonian nickname for Matisse or Matthew, was there to testify about someone stealing from the local church. But when he was asked to swear an oath to tell the truth, an innkeeper named Peter laughed. When people asked him what was so funny, he said, that guy can't swear an oath, he's a werewolf. And Old Thies was just like, yeah, I totally am. People were understandably pretty interested in this statement, and Old Thies was arrested and questioned, and in the face of enormous pressure, he insisted that they had him not all wrong, but kind of wrong. He wasn't changing into a wolf to help the devil like witches were known to do. He claimed he was changing into a wolf to steal livestock, and okay, so he and his werewolf friends entered hell once a year, but it's not what you think, judges. We only do that to fight the devil and make sure everyone's farms and fields are protected. And like, you're welcome. The judges just could not figure this guy out. 
And they couldn't get him to confess to diabolic conspiracy, which would have been the slam dunk evidence they needed for a conviction for witchcraft. So they punted the case to a higher court. And it's that higher court that preserved the original trial record. And it was this higher court that eventually rendered the verdict, which came down on, wait for it, October 31st, 1692. It wasn't good for old Thies, but it's maybe not as bad as you think. The illustrious, praiseworthy assessor of the Royal High Court, that was really his title, sentenced Old Thies to being publicly flogged on the hands and then banished. The court found Old Thies guilty of not listening to the Holy Word or taking the Holy Sacrament, and for refusing to budge from his belief that he could change into a wolf, thereby leading others into superstition and sin. They took him seriously, but they ultimately didn't believe Old Thies was actually a werewolf who traips down into hell for a yearly battle with the devil. Often people assume that medieval and early modern people were not only ready to believe just about anything, but that they didn't look for natural explanations. They did look into whether or not Old Thies was simply a delusional or confused old man, but no, he wasn't. Or at least he didn't have that reputation and didn't display those characteristics under intense questioning. You know, except for the whole werewolf thing. The transcript of Old Thies' interrogation goes on for pages and pages, so it was a protracted event. And while it surely had to have been stressful to him, it wasn't an interrogation conducted under torture. Plenty of people confess to all kinds of wild things when torture is threatened, and even more when it's used. But that wasn't Old Thies' situation. Livonia was an area on the shores of the Baltic Sea, where Latvia is today. And it was under the control of the Swedish king, who had outlawed the use of torture in 1686. And by the end of the 17th century, Livonian judges were not really using torture anymore, and they didn't even use leading questions in their interrogations by that point. And in fact, they seemed to not know what to make of old these. At times, they find him funny and at others frustrating, but without his voluntary and consistent and adamant insistence that he was a werewolf, he probably would have just lived out his days, freaking out his neighbors and just doing his thing. Historians, too, have had a bit of a difficult time trying to figure out what exactly is happening in the story. Legends that men are able to change into wolves goes back to at least the Romans and Greeks, Gervais of Tilbury was writing about it in England in the early 13th century, and in the mid-16th century, a University of Wittenberg professor named Caspar Pusser relayed a quote-unquote true narrative about a Livonian peasant who turned himself into a wolf. In the early 17th century, Heinrich von Uhlenbrock was complaining about Latvian peasants believing in werewolves. Heinrich calls the belief utterly ridiculous, a quote, deplorable delusion. But he also says that these people call themselves friends of God, which is a lot like what Old Thies was saying. Historians got really lucky that Old Thies's trial survived, and in such great detail, and they have used it in comparison to Greek, Germanic, and Russian mythologies, and of course the Benedanti, which were a small, self-proclaimed group of witch and devil fighters in late 16th and early 17th century Italy. There's something in Old Thies' story that tells us something about pre-modern peasant mentalities and culture, but of course there is a lot of debate about just what that is. One common theme shared by earlier stories and that appears in Old Thies' trial is that people become werewolves by drinking with other werewolves. In 1555, Olas Magnus wrote of a man who was turned into a werewolf because, quote, someone skilled in this type of magic handed him a mug of beer. In 1627, Paul Einhorn cautioned that transformation was the result of drinking with a werewolf who has said the words vi estorum verborum, which just means by the power of these words in Latin. And in 1692, Old Thies said that he was turned into a werewolf by a, quote, scoundrel from Marienburg, 
who gave him a drink after blowing on it and saying, it will be for you as it was for me. So my professional advice is that if you are going to a party this Halloween, get your own drink and watch out for werewolves. Although some of them sound like they're not bad guys. Happy Halloween. Ha 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 ha.